The next step is the detection, uh, after these noise sources have been removed, is the detection and characterization of events. Events are detected based on their power spectral density, such as from a periodogram, <coughs> which can be thought of as the average over time of a signal spectrogram, which would have units of uh, power spectral density, in this example, decibels with respect to one pentatesla per root hertz. <coughs> Another form of detection can be accomplished by a mediatogram, which is a similar device, where instead of taking the average over time of the spectrogram, we take the median, which has the effect of removing any unwanted impulsive noise. Events are then detected by a thresholding of the periodogram, and after events are detected, they may include either the desired emissions, chorus, and hiss, as well as other types of signals, which for this purpose, we consider unwanted noise, primarily from lightning. After the events are detected, 19 scalar characteristics are determined for each event. Although I won't go through them in detail now, you can see that they appear in several broad categories, such as characteristics which relate to the emission frequency, excuse me, event frequency, those which relate to the slope and amplitude of the mediatogram and periodogram, those which relate to time, and other somewhat more involved characteristics, such as the true amplitude of the signal, which is the average over the signal's frequency of its power spectral density, a measure of the signal's burstiness, where chorus would be considered a bursty emission and hiss not, as well as these uh, remaining four characteristics here, which relate to cross-correlation of adjacent rows of a signal spectrogram, and can give you an idea of the dominant slope of a spectrogram in frequency versus time of the signal. After the events have been characterized, they are then passed to the sequential pair of neural networks, the first of which distinguishes between emissions and noise, and the second between chorus and hiss. Now the basic constituent of a neural network is an artificial neuron, shown here. An artificial neuron consists of a series of scalar values for input, such as the 19 characteristics determined previously, which are then weighted and summed with a scalar bias, passed through an in general nonlinear transfer function, and the output is a scalar. To increase the complexity, neurons may be stacked in parallel layers, where instead of thinking of a series of weights and biases, we will instead think of a weight matrix and a bias vector. This stack of S neurons, each operating independently, then will have as, a, as output a vector of length S. Finally, multiple layers may be chained sequentially together, resulting in the final network architecture shown here, which is implemented in both neural networks. In this, uh, in this architecture, we receive these 19 characteristics as input, which are then passed to a hidden layer with 20 parallel neurons. The vector of 20 values is then uh, passed as input to a second layer, which is the, uh, called the output layer, which consists of a single neuron, and the output is a scalar. In the case of the noise neural network, the scalar output, output will be a binary value, either that the emission, or that, excuse me, that the event is noise or an emission, and in the case of the emission neural network, that the event is coarse or hiss. Finally, Finally, before the neural networks may operate autonomously, they must be manually trained. Training is the determination of the proper weights and biases for the neural network. The first step to this <laughs> is the construction of a training set, in which case a hapless grad student, such as myself, shown here in this file photo, manually goes through a subset of the detected events, which is 7% implemented here, and manually decides whether each one is chorus, hiss, or noise. This training set is then fed into the neural network training algorithm, which optimizes the weights and biases. <coughs> After training, the neural network is ready to autonomously distinguish between noise and emissions and chorus and hiss. For the neural networks implemented here, they're capable of categorizing noise with 92% accuracy and emissions with 84% accuracy, resulting in a rate of false positives of 8 and 16% respectively. The entire system is also very fast. After the initial assembly of the training set, which took about one work week for me, plus several months in therapy, which are ongoing, the net speed of the entire detector is 350 times faster than real time. <coughs> oh, 
I'll next discuss another contribution that makes use of the output of this automatic detection system. Before I go into the details of the results of uh, the, si the science done on this event database, it helps to discuss the dipolar geomagnetic coordinate system which we'll be using. <coughs> this coordinate system consists of three different coordinates, L, magnetic latitude, and magnetic local time. Uh, in this first picture on the left, which is a meridional plane where the north geomagnetic pole, represented by the positive z-axis, is pointing up, uh, L shell, or L value, is defined as follows. If you trace a given magnetic field line until it crosses the geomagnetic equator, the distance from the center of the Earth to that equatorial crossing in units of Earth radii is the L value of that dipole magnetic field line. For example, the field line shown in red here, which crosses the equator four Earth radii from the center of the Earth, would be described as L of four. The magnetic latitude is, a, is the angle between the geomagnetic equator and a point of interest on the field line. And if we move to an equatorial plane here, where now the north geomagnetic pole is pointing out of the page, uh, magnetic local time in units of hours is defined as zero facing away from the sun, 12 or noon facing towards the sun with all other hours in between. Most of the, all of the data used in these studies is from our receiving station at Palmer Station, Antarctica, which is located on the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, shown here. Uh, Palmer Station has the shown geographic parameters and geomagnetic parameters, the most important of which for this discussion will be its L value, which is at L of 2.4. Shown here is the Palmer antenna located on the Andrews Island Glacier and uh, myself remaining a safe distance away from local penguins in order to avoid violating the Antarctic Treaty, which I think has a large fine and several years of imprisonment. <laughs> so for this first study, we processed 10 continuous years of data from May 2000 through May 2010 and detected a total of 50,000 emissions, which would be quite a bore to do manually. One way of visualizing the results is in how the frequency and or in the frequency and time behavior of the two detected emissions chorus and hiss. As you can see here, chorus is observed exclusively in the dawn sector around 06 magnetic local time and has frequencies of up to about 5 kilohertz. In contrast, hiss is observed to some extent at all magnetic local times with peaks in the dawn and dusk sector and appears generally below about 1 kilohertz in frequency although there is some rising frequency in the dusk sector. Now the fact that hiss generally appears with frequencies below those of chorus will become somewhat more important later in the talk. We can also analyze the variation of chorus and hiss emissions over the course of our solar cycle's worth of data for about 11 years. If you, uh, shown here is a plot of emission occurrence of both chorus and hiss as a function of year averaged over a given year. Below that, we have the average KP and AE indices, which are proxy measurements of the geomagnetic activity at a given time, which in general is influenced by storms on the sun. We can see that on a yearly basis, chorus and hiss occurrence rate in emissions per day is, a, is strongly dependent on the geomagnetic activity level of that year. For example, if we look in 2003, which has a maximum of geomagnetic activity, we see a corresponding maximum in chorus and hiss occurrence. Similarly, in 2009, when we had a minimum of geomagnetic activity, we see a corresponding minimum in occurrence of chorus and hiss. If we look on a monthly basis, however, the situation changes. Over the course of a given year, where here I'm showing uh, the various months of a year, each averaged over our 10 years of data, we see that there is only a small variation in geomagnetic activity. However, if we especially look at chorus occurrence, there is a very large variation over a given year. And there's a similar variation in hiss, though to a lesser extent. It turns out that the reason that chorus and hiss occurrence is less dependent on geomagnetic activity in a given month is, is a result of the changes in solar illumination and resulting ionospheric absorption with the changing months. In the Antarctic winter, in June, there is a minimum of solar illumination, 
therefore a minimum of ionospheric density and a minimum of absorption in the ionosphere. This resulted a maximum in occurrence of emissions. Similarly, in the Antarctic summer, in December, there is a maximum of solar illumination, therefore a maximum in density and absorption in the ionosphere, and a corresponding minimum in observed emissions due to their increased absorption. The reason that Horus is significantly more affected by these changes in solar illumination than Hiss is a function of the fact that it generally appears at higher frequencies, where higher frequencies are more su subject to damping the ionosphere. This is better illustrated with a series of cumulative spectrograms, one for each month, each averaged over our 10 years of data. In, this first, uh, in these spectrograms, I've shown uh, dawn and dusk terminators, where dawn is the transition from darkness to daylight, and dusk is the transition from daylight to darkness. We can see in January, during the peak of the Antarctic summer, we have a maximum number of hours when the sun is visible, and therefore we're in daylight, and as a result, we can see a minimum of emissions. As we move through the seasons to June, we find ourselves uh, at the winter solstice, where there is a minimum of daylight at Palmer and a maximum of darkness, where we see this region of course occurring slight up. As we move again back to the Antarctic summer in December, we again have long hours of daylight and a minimum of observed emissions. Now the takeaway from these plots is not that course does not occur, in the December months, but merely that uh, these emissions, in particular chorus, is only visible during local night. This brings me to my third topic, which is the control of chorus propagation by the plasma sphere. Recall the current paradigm of chorus propagation, where either chorus propagates in a ducted mode to the ground or in a non-ducted mode, chorus is not receivable on the ground. This research aims to show that there is a third mechanism of non-ducted chorus propagation which may reach the ground under the right initial conditions. So I'm showing here on the right two models of electron density uh, in, unit, in logarithmic units for both a less disturbed case, which means a minimum of geomagnetic activity, where the plasma sphere has been more filled in and the plasma pause extent is greater, where plasma pause extent is uh, given by this variable L sub PP, or the plasma pause L shell, and a more disturbed case, where the plasma pause has become more eroded and therefore appears at a lower L shell. Now, course originates outside the plasma sphere, and as a result of that, it is able to observe and interact with the largest density irregularity of all, namely the plasma pause. During its propagation, Chorus may be significantly influenced by the instantaneous extent of the plasma pause by a refraction. Shown here are two simulations of chorus propagation, where in the two simulations, chorus has originated in the same area and propagates in the same initial direction, but given the differences in instantaneous plasma pause extent, it takes a very different path to the ground. For here we see a straight path, and here one with a magnetospheric reflection, which results in a very different final point. To measure the instantaneous plasma pause extent, we use the EUV, or Extreme Ultraviolet Instrument, on board the image satellite, which is a typical orbit of which is shown in this cartoon here. The EUV instrument detects uh, <coughs> extreme ultraviolet radiation, which is resonantly scattered from solar radiation from helium ions, which are a constituent of the plasma sphere. Shown here are two example images from the EUV instrument one showing a less disturbed case, where you can see the plasma sphere is more filled in, and one showing a more disturbed case, where the plasma sphere is more eroded. Now for this study, we manually located the plasma pause in EUV data for three months, and compared it with observations of chorus at Palmer Station, to get a feel for how, the plasma, for how chorus observations depend on the plasma pause extent. 